Right, let's take this thing apart. In the back we've got this extra battery, battery pack that screws onto the back. Bit of a fiddle to get off because it's tapered at the top so it wedges in a little bit. Connects okay. there, so just a custom made battery pack. That's, uh, four screws holding the uh, back cover on, which I've already taken out. First thing you see when you open it up is the multimeter board. This is actually a completely separate module. Um, it's got these connectors, they're just sort of plastic sleeves. They're soldered through the board. The problem is this whole board is mounted on these fairly flimsy pillars. Um, there's no rear support for them in the case, so if you're a bit um, clumsy with the 4mm plugs, I think eventually you might find these pillars starting to disintegrate. Let's take a close look at this multimeter board. Um, here we've got a Fortune DMM chip. This is a fairly standard chip. You're seeing quite a lot of cheap uh, digital multimeters. I'm guessing it's got an SPI interface that they're um, talking to it through. Uh, we've got a couple of auto isolators here and a DC to DC converter to provide power on the multimeter side. So it is completely isolated from the scope, which is good. Um, that's probably about the only good thing about this. We've got minimal input protection. There's a couple of resistors here and what looks like a thermistor or an MOV here. No fuse on the 10 amp range. There's a um, this 10 amp shunt is sort of soldered onto the board. I almost wonder if the calibration is by where they solder this down to, or whether that's just bad soldering. I don't know. Um, they claim this thing is uh, Cat 2, which means you can sort of safely connect it to main supplies and so on without any sort of serious danger. If you connect the current shunt across, which is clearly rubbish. If you connected this across the mains, it would just blast the track out. You've got these vents in the in the um, casing, so you could potentially get flame and blast coming out of the out of the case directly to the operator. So really not good. Um, this this little QC sticker was actually originally on top of the sounder, so it, it was reducing the amount of sound coming out of the sounder as well. Um, what else? Yeah, the, even worse than that 10 amp fuse, the, the unfused 10 amp range, the 400 milliamp range. It is fused. The problem is. The fuse is this soldered in surface mount one and a half amp fuse. So if you blow that fuse, which I mean 300 mill 400 milliamp range fuses are quite easy to blow by mistake, um, you'll have to take the thing apart, unsolder that fuse and solder it back in again. I mean that is just ridiculous, completely ridiculous. Um, so yeah, I mean this mul the multimeter in this scope should really be just treated as a toy and you should always just take a, a proper multimeter with you. Uh, if you go on site with it, you know, it, it, within limitations, if you're using it for low power, it's sort of usable, but, uh, you know, it's not, I, I almost wish they hadn't even bothered trying to include a multimeter. If you're going to put a multimeter in the scope, put a decent one in, or just don't bother. Make, you know, I'd sooner have a scope smaller um, than have a, a piece of crap like this in it. It's just a total waste of time. I suppose the only saving grace is if you do blow it up or whatever, it's a separate board, so potentially you could get a, a replacement board, but to be honest, you know, why would you bother? Another little detail I just noticed, where this fuse sits on the multimeter board, when that's screwed down, that's pretty much touching the shield on here. Now they have actually put a piece of um, clear plastic on there, but yeah, the, the, there's no overlap, so there's about maybe a half mil, perhaps one mil clearance between the multimeter and the scope ground, which again is yet another piece of crapness. Right, this is the main board. Um, on the back side here we've got this shielded area for the input stages. We'll have a look under the shield in a minute. Um, there's a Xilinx CPLD here. Um, that appears to be connected uh, around the display. Um, the, this is to do with the LCD controls and analog devices, uh, TFT driver chip. Um, there's a MAX202 RS232 interface there. I really don't know why they bother putting RS232 on, the, on this device. Um, I can't really see why you'd need it instead of uh, using USB. Okay. Turn it over, look at the front here, um, this is just a, a board with all the switches on it, there's not going to be anything interesting on there. And then there's a display module, so nothing of any interest there. Um, here we've got the main guts of the thing. Um, there's a Xilinx 3S400 FPGA, so there's a moderately big FPGA in there. Um, there's a couple of Intersil um, 250 mega samples, 10-bit A to D converters. 
Um, the data sheet says they uh, they're, say they're running at 250 mega samples a second, although the scope spec says 500, so I don't know if they're doubling up on the channels or they're just overclocking or they're just lying in the specs, hard to tell really. Um, this is the Samsung, it's the main processor, the Samsung ARM system on chip processor, so that's also going to be handling the LCD, the USB um, and all the actual um, software functionality. Uh, there's a RAM chip here, um, that's probably going to be the main uh, either well, the, the main acquisition RAM is probably on the FPGA, but this is going to be ex extra RAM for storing waveforms and so on. Um, lots of power supply circuitry around here, you can see all the inductors. Um, interesting, they've got a memory backup battery, which seems a little bit pointless, seems they've got a great big lithium on the back, um, which you know, I, I can't see is ever going to get really deeply discharged in practice. That's maybe slight overkill, but not, not a huge problem. Um, one interesting detail, there's actually some quite sort of nasty sort of soldering iron burns on this inductor. I can only assume they've sort of rather badly hand soldered this component down here and they've made a bit of a hash of the capacitor. Um, the stupid thing is there's plenty of space on here. They could have put a full-sized USB host socket for a USB stick but instead they've gone with this stupid little arrangement of having a little uh, cable which I'll, um, you'll see in the review. Um, and there's these two fairly sort of puny little USB sockets. The, there's a mini USB that, but that's used for the host port, on the on the go port. So yeah, it looks like if you want to use it as a USB peripheral, you actually need to use the funny um, socket rather than the standard mini USB. Um, overall build quality is sort of reasonable. It looks like there's been a few little bodges. There's a bit of um, there's a little bit of residual flux on the board, but it's yeah for a Chinese thing, it's sort of okay. It looks like there's they've made provision here to put a shield over the whole board, but they haven't fitted it. Um, these sort of um, uh, plain bits of PCB, they sort of, for example, where they've done here, they've soldered the edge of this shield down to them, so they've obviously provided for a shield there, but they sort of found they didn't need it, or decided they didn't need it, and again, similarly on this board, there's also provision for shielding on there. little detail here, um, it looks like they've made provision for this chip near the ATDs, I'm guessing that's going to be a clock generator um, to generate the high speed um, sample, sampling clock for these ATDs. I'm guessing that was an option, they didn't know whether or not they could get the clock it from the, via the FPGA, so they just put provision for a separate clock there and didn't fit it. Um, you can see, I'm not, not sure if it'll come out, there's actually um, these balanced tracks here, there's differential pairs going from here into each side of the FPGA, these will be the high speed. Um, data signals there. Um, the on-off switch is looks a little bit puny and it's a sort of clicky on-off switch. Um, not sure how, how well that will last but at least it's it's through hole so if it did disintegrate you could probably replace it without too much difficulty. Here's what's under the shield on the front end stage. Um, we've got a couple of relays here. There's a, a relay here which will be an input attenuation select. You hear some clickiness when you um, change, change over a certain range. There's a little solid state relay here. That's probably going to be connected across this capacitor. This will be the input capacitor. So this will be the um, ACDC input selection. Uh, it then goes into the, uh, most of this front end are analog devices chips. There's a one gigahertz um, high speed amplifier. Um, there's a chip there, I don't know what that is, um, number-wise, there's only about three digits on it. And there's another analog device, is um, digitally controlled variable gain amplifier. So again, they're probably using that to control some of the attenuation. Another analog device is amplifier chip here. Um, all pretty sort of standard stuff. A lot of these devices are designed for things like digital radio type applications and um, satellite receiver type things. Um, another bit of uh, nasty soldering iron graunch graunching gone on here. Uh, obviously some, it's not exactly what they've been trying to solder here but someone's clearly hit the edge of that relay with a soldering iron. Um, on the back here we've got a, there's a D2A converter that's for setting the um, X and Y offsets and there's a high speed ECL comparator that's going to be for the trigger. In fact this may well be for trigger level as well this stack. Come think of it because it's near this um, comparator. That's a high speed comparator to, to um, produce the trigger signal. Um, that's pretty much it. It's fair, pretty much a conventional front end.